to the third lecture in the series of lectures on Galois representations. Let's get uh, right away into it. Um, so last time uh, we started by thinking about like what are Galois representations and what are the properties we need for a representation to be a Galois representation that uh, brought us into this uh, um, uh, into understanding what a Galois group is, what an infinite Galois group is, and then we realized that that is built as a topological uh, profinite group. So we spent last lecture looking at tro uh, topological groups and profinite groups. And now it's time to go back to Galois rep representations and see what they are like. So uh, the Galois representations, Galois representations are actually classified by the coefficient ring. So remember that they are uh, representations, that are maps from Galois to the automorphism of some module of some ring. So that ring actually determines what the name, how we call these Galois representations. So if it is a module over a finite field, then uh, we call that a mod P Galois representation. So a finite field in characteristic P. So you can think of that just as if FP or FP square, FP to the N uh, and so on. So that would be a mod P Galois representation. If uh, the ring, the module is over some finite extension of uh, the L addix, uh, where L is a prime, uh, this could be uh, an extension of the L addix, or actually it could also be that it's a field, that it's an extension of the L addix numbers uh, also. Uh, but there is a way, I'm not going to get into that, but there is a way to uh, study if you have a Galois representation that lands into GL2 of QL of the Latex, there's a way to actually study it over the uh, Latex integers. There is some sub lattice that is fixed by the action of Galois, and you can reduce it to this case. But in any case, if the ring is an Latex ring, then we call that an Latex Galois representation. They're not very uh, imaginative uh, uh, names. Uh, when the ring is uh, z hat, because this is uh, uh, well that we call the the it has to do with the Adels of Q, so we call that an Adelic uh, Galois representation. And uh, when we are working over the field of the complex numbers, uh, we call that an Artin Galois representation. Here, uh, the number. Two is a symbol for any integer n <laughs> bigger or equal to two, or bigger or equal to one, really, not not just uh, two. Okay, so G L N off, uh, so all those should be uh, n's. Let's fix that. Okay. Great. So uh, let me start actually with uh, Artin uh, Galois representations, which are those uh, that land in the uh, matrices over the complex numbers. Uh, let me build some Artin Galois representations. So I can do that by choosing, if you choose uh, a finite Galois extension of Q, uh, then that has a Galois group. And that group has well, a theory of finite group representations. So what I can do is first go from the Galois group to this Galois group by restriction, and then uh, compose it with one of the representations you would get from a group on uh, finite uh, representations, representations of finite groups, okay? Which is something that is well understood. What are the possibilities for these ones? So this composition from here to here where you put in here, we need a topology. So the topology is the induced topology coming from the usual topology in the complex numbers. That gives you a topology on GLN. It's saying two matrices are close together if two components, if all the components are close together, right? So that gives you a, a topology in GLN. Um, so that's uh, that's an Artin Galois representation right there. That's an example of such a thing. So there's, there's many we can come up with. However, 
uh, well, what we will see is that actually they all look like this. All the arts and cultural representations come uh, like this. Let me give you first an example of that. Uh, so if you take F to be the uh, splitting field of X cubed minus five, uh, well, that uh, is this splitting field. Uh, that's, uh, that's a Galois extension. Uh, and that's an S3 extension. So it's generated by two elements, sigma and tau, uh, sigma of order three, tau of order two that have that relation. Where sigma is the element that uh, moves this one around and fixes that, and tau moves the root of unity around and uh, fixes that one. Great. So uh, what are the art and Galois representations attached to this field? We, uh, we send from here to here just restriction to the field F. And then I use the theory of uh, representations of finite groups. So what are the representations of S3? There is the identity. Uh, there's the trivial art and Galois representation that just goes, everything goes to one. I'm going to think of this one as uh, the one in GL1 over the complex numbers. Or this is simply... Uh, uh, C cross, right? This is just the, the complex numbers, really. And um, then if we move to something non trivial, there is a character epsilon, I'm going to call it, uh, that goes to plus or minus one, which is basically actually restriction. You see how there's a quadratic subfield, uh, which is adjoining a square root of minus three. I can do a farther composition down to restrict to that quadratic field. And then see how Galois acts on the square root of minus three, which is uh, what's happening here. Which is this this character is the one that will send. Um, um, so it sends sigma to one and tau, which is the non-trivial uh, automorphism of Q adjoint the square root of minus three, sends this to minus one. So the image of that uh, that character is just uh, into plus minus one which is this two, uh, the second roots of unity inside C cross, uh, which again, I'm gonna think of, of uh, GL1, okay? So that's another character or that uh, another representation of S3. And then there is a two dimensional representation of S3, which I'm gonna call rho and rho sends sigma to a matrix of order three, which is in fact the two pi over three rotation and tau is a reflection along um, that is reflect if this is some reflection okay so uh, that's another uh, that's an element of order two in the complex numbers and if you uh if you check these two these two matrices also have that property okay so this gives you a representation of s3 into uh gl2 of the complex numbers and these are the three uh representations uh, simple relations that the theory of finite groups will tell you. Okay, so those are the three um, um, the three article representations that are attached to this. You can do all their ones, which are not uh, not simple in that I can do, for example, in GL four, and the, and do sort of like a block matrix. Uh, but those are. They, they will factor into, it's not irreducible, so they will factor into some of these representations. Okay, so these are the irreducible ones. Great. So it turns out that all of them are actually of this shape. All the art and color representations come like this because, well, in here we have the cruel, the profinite topology, and in here we have the topology induced from the complex numbers. But remember that the point of the last lecture was that uh, the Galois group is profinite, and therefore it's Hausdorff compact and totally disconnected. In particular, the image of the since rho is assumed to be a continuous uh, homomorphism, the image of rho is compact and totally disconnected in GLN of the complex numbers, and that implies that the image is finite. Okay, so it just, this is just a topological argument, which I'm leaving actually as a as an exercise. But if you just think of GL1, suppose this is a, a GL1 uh, representation, so it's going into the complex numbers. Uh, if first of all, if it is compact, a compact subgroup would have to be bounded. But if it is bounded, you can prove that it has to be in the circle 
of radius one, the image has to be containing the circle of radius one. And then if it is totally disconnected, then if you try to do some subgroup that is infinite inside the circle of radius one, you'll see that you end up getting something that is dense in the circle of radius one. So if it is not dense because it's totally disconnected, it actually has to be a finite subgroup of roots of unity. Okay, so this is an exercise to prove it first for GL1 and then prove it for GLN. Uh, so the image is finite. If it is finite, it means that the kernel of rho, the kernel of my Galois representation, uh, is open and of finite index because the image is finite, just mod out by the kernel, and then uh, that will be isomorphic as some finite subgroup of GLN. So the kernel is open finite index, and now is when I use my correspondence, my Galois correspondence. Thankfully, this is continuous with respect to the cruel topology. So now I know that my kernel is a Galois group of some extension Q bar over F. Okay, so I can, uh, that is finally where we see it in action that I can make that conclusion. And, uh, and therefore, uh, the, the, the Galois representation factors through the Galois group of F over Q. So it is actually of the form we described before. It goes from the Galois group restricts to the Galois group of F over Q and then goes to GLN. So if you look at this piece, that is a representation of the finite group Galois of F over Q. So they are all of that type um, that we described before. So they all come uh, like that. So whether you think this is exciting or not uh, depends on uh, whether you think that representations of finite groups are exciting or not. Um, and if you've written a book about representations, <laughs> then you probably think so. <laughs> uh, but in any case, they do come up in uh, several settings in number theory. The article representations come up, for example, in uh, the factorizations of L functions. When you have an L function of an elliptic curve over a number field, um, you can do some factorizations and uh, find fac uh, factors of the whole function according to the arting Galois representations that you have of your the number field with the elliptic curve is defined over. So this is these are important. So uh, in any case, but I want to move on to the other ones in our list. So uh, where do other Galois representations come from? We want to find them sort of in nature. You want to go out for a walk and like start finding Galois representations, uh, so we can get information about the absolute Galois group of Q, right? So how do we build those? Uh, one way is uh, through Artin, uh, Artin representations, just because of the way we, we can uh, construct irreducible representations of finite groups. So that is one way. Okay. Uh, how about somewhere else? From algebraic number theory, I mean algebraic number theory because, well, I know about uh, number fields and then I can use uh, those to represent them. Um, other ways you can do, for example, if you have roots of unity in algebraic number theory, I can do Galois representations because if I have mu n, uh, the nth uh, uh, roots of unity, then I can do the automorphisms of mu n the automorphisms, this is an abstract group, it's Z mod NZ, and the automorphisms of mu N then are going to be Z mod NZ cross. That corresponds to the map that sends a Galois element. It will determine the automorphism on the roots of unity. It will, determine, it will be determined by where one root of unity goes, one nth primitive root of unity goes, but it has to go to some power, which is relatively prime to N, it has to go to some other root of unity, and they are all of this shape, a power of the root of unity. So that A is an element in C mod and Z cross, and that is the isomorphism between the Galois group of Q adjoined the nth roots of unity and this group. Okay, so the Galois representation we get from algebraic number theory from the roots of unity goes from the absolute Galois group of Q to uh, Z mod and Z cross by sending sigma to a mod n, which is the power that one root of unity goes to um, when you act with Galois, okay? Uh, it turns out, so here it looks like I made a choice of a root of unity, 
and that this A might depend on the root of unity I chose, but it turns out it's independent of that choice. So this is um, some canonical uh, representation. Okay, so that gives me a representation from the Galois group of Q to Z mod and Z cross. And uh, moreover, those, uh, which was one representation for every N, uh, when I choose a different N, I choose an M, these are compatible. In which way? They are compatible in that if I have two numbers, uh, such as N divides M, so M is some larger integer divisible by N, then uh, well, they, uh, my Galois element will send the nth root of unity to some power of itself. It will send nth roots of unity to some power of themselves. And now AM is considered modulo M, AN is considered modulo N. But if you look at then what is sigma of the nth root of unity to the kth power, where k is the cofactor of uh, N in M, uh, well, this is. Um, this is an nth root of unity, so it acts by taking it to the a to the a nth power, right? Because uh, what we I said before, it actually does not depend on what root of unity. It sends all the nth root of unity. It sends them to the a n power. Okay, so it sends it here. And on the other hand, if I go, well, this is an nth root of unity, take the k, it's a, it's a, a group homomorphism, so the k can come out, and then it will send uh, the nth root of unity to the a mth power, and that gives me this number here. And uh, if you compare now, it sent this root of unity to the a mth power, and this nth root of unity to the a mth power, so they have to agree modulo n. So am and an agree modulo n, which means that all those numbers, if you build an infinite sequence of numbers modulo m, those are a coherent sequence under divisibility of the index. But we've seen this in lecture two. This is an example of a profinite group, our favorite profinite group, because it's z hat. Okay, so uh, that is an element. All these powers are an element of Z hat. And then if we let the Tate module of Q, the Tate module of the roots of unity to be the inverse limit of all the nth roots of unity, then uh, this Tate module is isomorphic to Z hat, and therefore the automorphism group is the units in Z hat. And what we get is a super duper uh, Galois representation of uh, of Q, which goes into the automorphism of all roots of unity, so it encompasses all cyclotomic uh, uh, actions, uh, all the actions of the Galois group on cyclotomic units. Okay, so this is called the, the adelic. This is the adelic uh, cyclotomic character. Okay. And uh, here you have it. So uh, if I go into the action on all the, what do we call the Tate module of Q, then I get a representation into Z hat cross, which is GL1 over Z hat, right? And then if I uh, go down, there is a way to go down to ZP cross, which is remember that this uh, using the Chinese remainder theorem was a product of all ZP crosses. And if I do a composition with a projection to one of those coordinates, then I go to ZP cross, and it turns out this is isomorphic to the automorphisms of the uh, P power cyclotomic units or cyclotomic um, uh, roots of unity, not cyclotomic units, uh, roots of unity. And uh, this is what we call the p -adic. Uh, cyclotomic character. And if I go down and I just reduce modulo P, then I get to the uh, mod P cross uh, uh, group, which is the automorphism of the P roots of unity. And what I get uh, going this way is what we call the mod P cyclotomic character. Okay, so this is one example of how algebraic number theory is uh, a source of Galois representations, this one in particular being very important uh, in all of uh, our theory 
the cyclotomic characters. Uh, where else can we find? Yes, Ben. Correct. Correct. So in between here, I can cut, and instead of going here, I can go first to Z mod uh, P to the N Z. That's a natural uh, projection of Z P cross, and that would go uh, down here also. This is isomorphic to the automorphisms of the uh, P to the nth uh, roots of unity. So that one is in between there, and that I would call uh, chi P to the n, uh, which is the P, the mod P to the n um, cyclotomic character. That is an in between uh, uh, character, uh, which is not sort of one of our, our official names. Uh, which was remember mod p actually refers to the ring is a finite field in characteristic p uh, a piatic it actually has to be a piatic ring so this one is some uh, some in between hybrid uh, but that is it is important the same way I could cut out in zp in uh, in here I could project to a product of two primes, right? ZP cross cross CQ cross, uh, and get some something else in there, some other type of representation. So there's a lot of maps. Z hat cross has a lot of maps uh, down to different projections that would result in characters that cut out the kernel cuts out different uh, subfields of the maximal abelian extension of Q. Yep. So the P to the N one. Uh, the to the N one. Uh, it is it is irreducible. Yeah, it's not. This is not the classification is not just about irreducible. The, so these the chi P to the N that is still an irreducible representation. Yes. By the way, uh, these ones also are important if you use the Kronecker Weber theorem, and you have. Uh, uh, and a uh, character that goes into an abelian image, so some um, GL1 that ends up being some abelian subgroup, uh, then you can use the Kronecker Weber theorem to prove that it is in here. This one, this adelic one is actually parameterizing uh, because the kernel cuts out, the kernel of this one cuts out the maximal abelian extension of Q, so Q abelian. Everything with an every Galois representation with an abelian image is somehow present already here. Okay, so that's that would be a big consequence of Kronecker Weber. All right, where else can we find Galois representations? Uh, they appear in geometry. How so? Here is an example. So if you have an elliptic curve, uh, which um, well, it's some smooth projective dimension one variety genus one with at least one Q rational point then I can uh, base extend uh, E to Q bar and look at all the Q bar points on E. That is an abelian group. We talked about this uh, last time. It's not finitely generated anymore over Q bar. It is finitely generated over Q, uh, but the uh, torsion is well behaved in that the torsion, the N torsion, so the points uh, of order dividing N, it is isomorphic to Z mod N cross Z mod N. And uh, the map multiplication by N from points to points is actually defined over Q because addition on E is defined over Q. Therefore, when I act with Galois on uh, N times a point, the multiplication by N map is defined over Q, which means that all the coefficients is actually an algebraic map with all the coefficients defined over Q. So they actually commute with the action of Galois. And this commutation, the fact that the, these two commute for all uh, automorphisms and for all points in Q bar means that uh, the end torsion would actually land in the end torsion. So if this is zero, then uh, N times a conjugate of that point will also land in zero. So this means that the end torsion is sent to the end torsion. And since sigma is actually an automorphism, the end torsion is sent exactly to the end torsion. What that means is that 
Galois actually gives me automorphisms of the n torsion of my elliptic curve, and that defines a representation which I'm going to call um, rho n, or uh, if you want to specify the elliptic curve, rho e comma n, which is sending sigma to the automorphism of the n torsion given by that sigma. Again, those automorphisms, uh, these uh, rho n's, are compatible in that if n divides m, then uh, the same thing happens that uh, where these automorphisms sends a multiple uh, k of an m torsion point, this k can come out of that action, and then this is an n torsion point, and this is an n torsion point, and it's telling you that the action is compatible of how it acts on the m torsion and how it acts in the n torsion if n divides m. The upshot is like in like like in the case of roots of unity that I can make a uh, a sequence of points on my uh, each one on the m torsion of the elliptic curve such that if I have a sequence of points such that the k multiple of pm is pn, so it's a coherent sequence with respect to the multiplication maps in the elliptic curve, then what I get is a, an inverse limit, which we call the Tate module, the adelic Tate module of the elliptic curve, and because each one of those is z mod n cross z mod n in the, uh, in the limit, what I get is a z hat cross z hat um, uh, module. So what I get actually when I act on all the torsion at the same time, I get what we call the adelic Galois representation attached to the elliptic curve, which I have again here in a in a bigger diagram. So we have this uh, this map where I've chosen so the automorphisms of the Tate module. If the Tate module is isomorphic to z hat cross z hat, the automorphisms will be GL two over z hat. But however, when when we talked about like the automorphisms of the Tate module of cycle, of cyclotomic um, towers, that that was canonically z hat cross. That actually is not canonical here. It actually depends on what basis I picked of the Tate module over z hat. Uh, so this depends on what basis I get. But what the image is actually, well, like you can do a change of basis. And then, so the image is well defined up to conjugation uh, in here because of the change of basis things. In any case, I get uh, an adelic representation attached to E. I get if I reduce to the or if I project to the to the elliptic component of Z hat, then I get an elliptic representation, and it turns out to be the representation of the action on the Tate module on the elliptic Tate module which is only when you look at L to the N torsion and then do the inverse limit. And again, we can reduce mod L and actually the representation that I get here is the representation on the action on the L torsion. So I get uh, an adelic, an elatic, and a mod L representation. And again, like we had before, there is all sorts of other maps in between that I'm omitting, but those are the, uh, the main ones we um, we consider. Okay, so this is the again a source and for every elliptic curve. I have these maps. Very interesting is that um, over Q, the cyclotomic, the adelic cyclotomic uh, character is surjective. You do know we do know that the maximal abelian extension, the Galois group, is isomorphic to Z hat cross. So that character has to be surjective. Okay, so if I go back here, I can actually write another arrow here to say that this is actually uh, surjective, surjective there, and it is again because of uh, basically Kronecker Weber. However, here we do not know that in fact it is not true. It's uh, it is in fact never true over Q that this is surjective. Sayer proved that this image is always an uh, a, a, it's an open subgroup, but it's of index two in here. We'll talk more about properties of elliptic curves uh, next time. So it is never all of GL2 Z hat is always an open uh, subgroup, which is at least of index two in here. However, 
Uh, down to GL2ZL, it is sometimes um, surjective. And SER proved that actually for almost all L, for all but finite domain primes, it is surjective to GL2ZL. But again, there is some very important open conjectures, which we will talk about next time, about uh, what do we know about when is this surjective to GL2ZL. And again, uh, modulo L, when is this not surjective to GL2 Z mod LZ? That is also um, uh, an area of open research. What are the possibilities for the images here? We think we know all the possibilities and we have a conjecture of some possibility of an image that we think it doesn't happen too often. And again, I'll, I'll specify what that means next time. Yeah, question. So, very good question. So, uh, this was geometry in dimension one and for elliptic curves with the projective varieties of dimension one. Why don't we do uh, abelian varieties in general? Here you go. So, if you have an abelian variety of dimension G, so uh, an elliptic curve over the complex numbers, they look like a torus, like a flat torus, complex numbers modulo a lattice. You can do that in more in higher dimensions and get something like uh, uh, G copies of the complex numbers modular modula lattice, and you can make that into what we call an abelian variety. It turns out that that is has a structure of an algebraic variety, so it's also defined by equations, just like elliptic curves. Great. So um, what do we know about abelian varieties over the rational numbers? That is why the Mordell ve theorem is the Mordell ve theorem, where they'll prove uh, the finite generation over Q for elliptic curves. They generalize that to abelian varieties over number fields that we know that those are finitely generated abelian groups and so on. So we can actually construct by acting on, uh, on abelian varieties. Uh, we can construct uh, Galois representations. By the way, where on earth do you find these uh, varieties? Well, if you know what a Jacobian is, so if you have a curve, uh, a curve of genus G, the curves of genus 1, if they have at least one point, those are elliptic curves. They're smooth, projective, and so on. Then they have a point, those are elliptic curves. If it's a curve of higher genus with a point, Unfortunately, there is no group structure there, but we construct what we call the Jacobian variety, and the Jacobian varieties are abelian varieties. If it's the, a Jacobian of, an ellip, of a curve uh, of dimension G, then the Jacobian will have dimension G, and it will be one of these. So you can find them, and they are, are used, for example, for uh, cryptographic reasons. Uh, they use cryptography on Jacobians of curves. So these come up in 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 your phones um, when you do cryptography, okay? Uh, when you send messages. All right, so um, so we can uh, look at an abelian variety, look at the uh, torsion point on the abelian variety. It turns out that the torsion, uh, so the end torsion of an elliptic curve was two copies of Z mod NZ. If you go to uh, an abelian variety of dimension G, the torsion is, uh, 2G copies of Z mod NZ. So what you end up getting is that we get adelic representations that are contained into in GL2 of 2G Z hat. Okay, so we get other other representations in that way. And then by doing projections, we can get adelic, lattic model representations attached to abelian varieties. Similarly, and not similarly, but actually very much connected, both things through, if, if you were watching the movie uh, yesterday about the proof of Fermat-Lewis theorem, you know that these are actually somehow abelian varieties, the representations, the color representations of abelian varieties and the color representations of modular forms, they are mysteriously related through modularity. But in any case, uh, you can, we also, that was known before, that if you have a modular eigenform F, then there is also a way to construct uh, Galois representations. I will not get into the construction of those, but you can uh, over some um, some elliptic uh, ring, uh, some ring. But in any case, you can construct also Galois representations attached to modular forms to eigenforms. 
Yeah. I understand you're not going to go over the depth. Can you at least explain that's GL two uh, two comma. What is that object? The, this object is a ring that is uh, O sub F. Uh, and it's a ring that depends on the modular form. It depends on the coefficients uh, the, where the modular form lives. So if you write a, a Fourier expansion for your modular form, the coefficients will live in some number field, and that number field determines like what the the coefficient ring of the uh, of the modular form of the Galois representation will be. Thank you. Yeah. So you can build more like that. So where else uh, do we find Galois representations? in cohomology groups. So uh, more generally, much more generally, uh, you take an algebraic variety, X, and then base extend it to Q bar, take L B a prime, and again, I'm definitely not going to go into what a tall cohomology is, but you can build cohomological groups defined by Artin and Grothendieck. Uh, there is Grothendieck, uh, by the way, if you've never read Grothendieck's um, Wikipedia entry or some biography, please go and do it. That, that's why I wrote here stateless. Uh, so to pique your interest and in, like reading like why, why that is. Um, okay, so in any case, you can build out of cohomological groups. You can build on the et al side of your algebraic uh, variety, you can build a tall cohomology groups. You can do an inverse limit of these groups. Uh, the inverse limit is happening on that end over there, and that will give you an adelic cohomology, uh, a tall cohomology group. And uh, the Galois group, the absolute Galois group, acts on those cohomology groups. Now, that is a very large uh, uh, Galois representation typically not irreducible, and there are several factors and cofactors and quotients that you can do, and it gives you a huge variety, maybe variety is not the right word, but a huge uh, uh, set of Galois representations attached to these uh, Galois groups. So, for example, I mean, those are the automorphisms of those cohomology groups uh, give you a new way to construct uh, Galois representations. So where else can we find Galois? Yeah. Uh, the coherent sequences are in here. So uh, you, can, uh, you can write maps that go from uh, Z mod L, M, L to the M down to L to the N. So the coefficients in this cohomology, there is a map going down from one cohomology group to another one. There is also relations between different eyes. So here I is fixed, right, in this cohomology group. So I get the i-th Galois representation on the i-th cohomology. But there is also relations between, uh, you know, like the Betty numbers and all sorts of uh, relations between the dimensions of these cohomology groups that are interesting uh, on, on their own right. So, uh, but in any case, the, the coherent sequence that the projective limit is on that end over there. So those are the maps that we're considering. Yeah. Oh, I, I'm not going to get into like, that. That would take, but I mean, we would have to, these cohomology groups. These are some functions, and then you can you can express them in terms of some functions, and these functions, the action of Galois um, sends these functions to. So they give you if you have a cohomology class, the action will give you another cohomology class. So let, let's not go into that ra rabbit hole, um, but yeah. This? Yeah. That's the etal site. So uh, so that's part of how you define the etal cohomology. Okay, great. So cohomology, if you want some huge black box, but there are uh, Galois representations, a lot of Galois representations coming from there. Uh, but it turns out that they capture every other example we've seen so far. It turns out that if you have uh, an algebraic curve of genus G, if you look at the uh, cohomology group, the first, just the first cohomology group is isomorphic to the elatics to the 2G power. And it turns out that this Galois representation that you get on just the first cohomology group is dual to the Tate module 
of the Jacobian of that uh, of that algebraic curve. Okay, so by uh, by looking at the cohomology group and again just the first cohomology group, you actually retrieve the uh, the Galois Galois representations attached to E. If G is one, if G is bigger than one, we retrieve the Galois representations attached to the Tate module of an abelian variety. Uh, similarly, by looking, uh, if you take your curve to be some modular curve, the modular curve, the modular forms are are related, are differential forms in some sense of like attached to modular curves. So if you take the modular curve, it turns out that the cohomology groups retrieve the Galois representations attached to modular forms also. Um, so somebody went ahead and said, is there some Galois representation that does not appear? In a cohomology group, and it turns out that there is a conjecture that they are all in there. The cohomology groups uh, basically characterize all the Galois representations that somewhat make sense. There's two big conjectures. Uh, there was a, what we call Sayers conjecture, which was proved by Carrea, Winton Verge, and uh, Dulefay. Um, so if you have so in this conjecture, what it said is that if you start from um, some Galois representation that is a mod L Galois representation. And if it's odd and irreducible odd, this is something about like that the um, that um, complex conjugation acts as you would uh, expect. And it's an irreducible Galois representation. There is actually a modular form that gives you that Galois re representation. So uh, this was a first instance of you have any Galois representation that has the natural properties of being odd and irreducible, they actually come from modular forms. But we know that the ones from modular forms come from cohomology. So then there was uh, what we call the fontaine mazur conjecture, uh, which is actually, well, it's known in, in, uh, for uh, dimension one or the last, and I believe uh, for dimension two work of uh, Emerton and Kissin actually proved the fontaine mazur conjecture for a LADEC. Uh, representations. Uh, what it says is that if you have a Galois representation over for GL over some vector space um, over the um, uh, over the latex, uh, so some irreducible representation that is unramified at all but finitely many primes. There are representations that are ramified at infinitely many primes, but those. Those we know they should not come from geometry. There is infinitely many ramified primes. So the ones that are naturally could naturally come from geometry, the ones with finitely many ramified primes, and uh, this is some other natural condition that at um, if you restrict to a decomposition group, uh, if that is the ram again, I'm not going to get into what the ram means in this course. Uh, then rho appears in some cohomology group of an algebraic variety and appears by this vague appears. I mean that, as I said, when you act on a cohomology group, uh, there are is not irreducible. So it could be a factor. It could be a, a quotient of one of those color representations, but it shows up in there. Okay. So it seems that all the natural color representations, uh, they are actually all coming from uh, geometry in quotes, meaning cohomology, a tal cohomology of a geometric object. Okay. Very good. So, um, now, if you have a Galois representation, how are we going to compute what the image of that Galois representation is? If we want to get an understanding of what uh, the kernel is, for example, for that Galois representation, I'm going to need to know what is the image of this Galois representation. The problem is that the absolute Galois group of Q is so mysterious that we cannot write basically any elements of that group. So we know there is an identity element, and we know there are complex conjugation elements, right? Um, some element of order two that sends i to minus i. Great. What else is there? Well, uh, that's where Frobenius elements come in. Because if you are following uh, Keith's course on uh, Shabotarev, Shabotarev tells you that Frobenius elements are great, at least at the finite, uh, 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 the, in the number field case, 
Frobenius elements represent every element of the Galois group. So if you know where Frobenius elements go, then you might be able to retrieve where everything goes. Okay. However, this is an infinite extension and Shibotarev, at least the usual statement of Shibotarev, is for finite extensions of, uh, of Q. Uh, so here is a picture of Frobenius. All right. So um, just very quickly, uh, what are Frobenius elements? So remember that if you have a Galois extension uh, and you have an extension of, well, the extension of the ring of integers and you have a prime, this is how the prime factors, pick a prime above P, then that gives you an extension of finite fields. And inside the Galois group, you can define the decomposition group, which are uh, Galois elements that fix that prime, that chosen prime, sends it to itself. And inside that, there is what we call the inertia subgroup, those elements of the decomposition group that actually uh, in, the, uh, in the map that is induced in the Galois group here, it acts like the identity. It sends uh, classes to themselves, okay? So what it turns out is that uh, the decomposition group modulo inertia is isomorphic to the Galois group of that extension of finite fields. And those extensions to finite fields are cyclic, generated by Frobenius. So uh, by the Frobenius map, the Frobenius automorphism, where F is uh, the degree of that extension. So if you take, uh, if we, so we know that the decomposition group subjects onto uh, this extension, take the Frobenius element, the Frobenius automorphism, and find an element in the decomposition group that lands in the Frobenius element. So those are uh, the Frobenius elements in the Galois group. Now, uh, when, for example, if uh, the prime is unramified in the extension, then that means that inertia is trivial and the decomposition group will be isomorphic to that Galois group. And we, uh, we write um, for, uh, we have the Frobenius element, but also the conju conjugacy class of those elements, uh, because it depends, like, this depends on what prime above P I chose, but if I choose, uh, choose another one, then I get a conjugate of this element in the Galois group. So the conjugacy class um, is denoted from P with a uh, little p. And here's Chubotarev, who, who, by the way, uh, this is the picture that appears in at least one of the t-shirts uh, for the conference and in the poster for the conference, um, because, uh, well, the Chubotarev density theorem was proved a uh, 100 years ago, but also because Chubotarev uh, was born in what we call now Ukraine, which of course is going through an insane hardship as we speak. Uh, so that's why we decided to um, basically um, make this summer school in the in honor of Chubotarev. So uh, the Chubotarev density theorem, this is just a, a weak version of Chubotarev, which where there is now actually um, a discussion of like the density of these primes. It says that if you have a finite Galois extension, then every element of the Galois group takes the form of a Frobenius for infinitely many uh, we can choose them to be unramified because there's only finitely many ramified primes, prime ideals of the ring of integers. So I can construct an entire Galois group of a finite extension using Frobenius elements. Now, if you have an infinite extension, that is no longer true. However, I can build decomposition groups in the absolute Galois group as inverse limit of decomposition groups. And uh, these decomposition groups is still uh, here, uh, the Galois group of the absolute, uh, the absolute Galois group of a finite field, it is not cyclic anymore, but it's topologically cyclic. This group um, will have um, uh, Galois group Z hat, and uh, Z hat is not topologically, it's not cyclic, but it's topologically cyclic. So I can take a topological generator and if I have a Frobenius element that maps to that topological generator, what that means is that uh, these Frobenius elements are no longer all of the Galois group, but they are dense. So I'm not going to be able to get to every element of the Galois group, but I'm going to be able to get as close as I need to to compute 
images with as much precision as I need to compute it. So that's fantastic. Uh, so I'll finish with an example, which I think uh, Keith has already mentioned in his class, which if you have a, the Galois group of the nth roots of unity, that is, um, that is Z mod NZ. And if, in here, if P is unramified, so I'm going to pick uh, a P uh, that does not divide N, then uh, it turns out that the Frobenius class of, uh, of a prime above P lands in the class of P mod N. And since uh, Dirichlet uh, theorem tells me that there are infinitely many for any class modulo N, there is a prime that hits that class. What this tells you is that Dirichlet's theorem uh, realizes Shevard Harris's dream in that I can construct every Galois element as an image of a Frobenius element. Okay, so every element in this group can be realized as a Frobenius of a prime that is not uh, dividing n. And what that means for me is that if I have the cyclotomic, uh, the elatic Galois representation into CL cross, and I take a prime that is not L, then the Frobenius class, a uh, Frobenius element in the Galois group will land in the class of P, not P mod L or P mod L to the N. Those are the finite levels, but in the elatics, it lands on P uh, in, as an elatic number. And if P is not L, this is a unit. Right. So Chebut Harif tells me that these Frobenius elements are dense, and Dirichlet tells me that the primes, the prime numbers, are actually dense in ZL cross. So I can't construct exactly all the image, but I can tell you exactly what the image is, that the image of this cyclotomic character will be all of CL cross, and I can build it, so Frobenius element by Frobenius element, I can send, if you, get, if you give me any other element of the Galois group of Q, I can get a Frobenius element as close as I want to that element, send it over, and tell you uh, what unit in CL cross your element is very close to using Frobenius classes. Okay, so this is how we use Chotarev to compute images with color representations. And well, next time, what we're going to do is, uh, first of all, we're going to do this for elliptic curves. Uh, we're going to see the Frobenius elements. Uh, actually, I'm, we're going to do it for arting color representations, and then we're going to do it for elliptic curves, also see how Frobenius elements help you decide what the image of a color representation is. And then we're going to spend a bunch of time talking about the law representations of elliptic curves, where much of my research lately is on, and there is uh, very exciting uh, results uh, that have been published and announced in the last, like in the in the last few months, uh, that are very very interesting. So there's a lot of action happening on this area of uh, Galois representations that touch the elliptic curves. And I will try to give you an update of what we know and what we don't know yet in that area. So I'll stop there. Thank you.